Music Matters, Maddie Davis. What's up? Nice to meet you. How are you? Thank you for doing this. Of course. Thanks for having me. <laughs> yeah. Good to be here. Of course. On this on this rainy, rainy summer day. Yeah. It's, it woke me up last night, the rain. Really? Yeah. I tried to open the window last night to listen to the rain, but Mario had other ideas. Oh. <laughs> he was like, it's too cold. Yeah. My, my room is in the attic, so my, my window is slanted, so it just... So loud every single time it rains. What do you? What do you? Mean? Oh wait, by slanted do you mean it's like, like a skylight sort of? Oh, that's cool. But it's like a slanted window, so it's not. But like is it is it an attic? Yeah. Does that get super hot or is like super cold? Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have AC, but you know it does get it does get quite hot. Yeah. <laughs> That's crazy. Used to it by now though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah, it was like I, I kind of hate. W- like this part of spring yeah. when it'll like still rain. Cause it's like, I don't know. Like I'm, I'm very much a summer person. Like I very much, am like always wanting it to be summer, like no matter what the season is. So right. it's like when it's like, this kind of like weird, like gray middle period. Like I'm always like waiting. I feel like that's how, that's how I was when I was in school a lot yeah. too. Cause it's, it's purgatory. like, yeah, it's, it's weather ex- purgatory. exactly. It's like during May, I was always just like, damn, I just want school to be over. Yeah. I'm so with you on that. I'm, I've, couple more days of school then I'm done yeah and so, it's summer, so. so you're like really about to finish <laughs> I am yeah I, I it's, it's crazy saying it out loud because mm-hmm. I'm just you know I feel like for so many years I was like oh, I'm gonna drop out or like oh I'm not gonna <laughs> finish or whatever yeah um and a week away I I couldn't drop out even if I wanted to <laughs> So w- I, I guess that is kind of an interesting thing, too, because it's I, I guess when you're like a musician, like actively going through college, yeah. it always is like, you know, like the subliminal goal. It's like, you know, I, I'm going to I'm gonna blow up, start making full time money off music and then just drop out. Yeah. But I guess like I, I think a lot of people do that preemptively. Yeah. You know, like I, I, I don't see any reason why like you wouldn't keep going and finish if you can, you know. Right. Yeah. It was always sort of like if there was an opportunity that I couldn't pass. Like up, a tour or something. Yeah. Something that would make me need to like do a leave. I would do it. Um, but it's, you know, I, I kind of, I got lucky and unlucky at the same time where uh-huh. I'm like, okay, there was nothing that was like, okay, you have to drop out right now. Um, but I was able to finish, which I'm really pumped about, about now. I just like, can say that I finished college. Were you ever close to dropping out? Like, was there anything uh, that like yeah. you considered it? I mean, like not for any good reason, uh-huh. but like I was in college smack in the middle of COVID. Yeah. So there how, was how a old while, are you? I'm 23. Okay. I did a gap year though. So. I, um, sh- my, a lot of my friends from home or all my friends from home are graduated from college. Mm-hmm. So I'm a year behind everybody. Um, and a year older than all my college friends. Not but behind, just a different, different pace. Yes, exactly. Exactly. But yeah, so I was a freshman during COVID and that was a very weird time. Cause I was like, what am I doing in college? Like, this is so stupid. Like, why am I yeah. going to online school? Um, so for a while I was like, Oh, I shouldn't be doing this. So like waste money, whatever. Um, and then I was like, well, there's nothing else I'm doing. Like, I'm literally mm. not, I'm not, like, busy with anything else. Like, I have nothing but time. <laughs> so I'm like, yeah. I might as well just, like, continue working on getting my degree. Um, and then I'm, I'm really glad that I did that. Was COVID, do you think, like, I mean, in comparison to a lot of your friend experiences of it? Because, like you said, like, a lot of them are a year ahead, a, a, a year I don't like the word ahead. Like, yeah, if I feel like it implies that you're behind, but like, <laughs> but like, mean. but you know, like their sophomores when you were freshmen in COVID, yeah. did that? You think like was your experience a lot different than theirs? Because I had the I had the year before experience. Mm. So I was a, I was a senior in like March of 2020. Cool. So I never got to finish high school. Mm. Like I got a degree, but like I didn't get to like there was no graduation or yeah. anything. So that was like my experience with it. Was it weird like kind of going into this new world and like being at a new school and then all of a sudden everything's just gone? Oh yeah, hundred percent. I also didn't start at uh, USC, which is where I go, um, until January of uh-huh. 2020. So I was there for two months, like exactly two months, and then COVID hit. So Whoa. it wasn't enough time for me to like feel like. Los Angeles was my home and I was coming from New York. So it was a huge jump. And then I kind of like started to feel like I was getting my footing. And then it was like, okay, never mind. You're going back to New Jersey and, li- and living with your mom for six months. So it was definitely alarming. And then going back to LA after that was like very, very jarring. Cause I was like, yeah. I have no friends. I don't know what I'm going to do. Like I have no life there and I'm just going back to like nothing, which was very scary. Um, but I also think that it like, changed a lot about the trajectory of my life because it made me kind of like look at everything from a bird's eye view and then um things would be so different if I didn't didn't stick with it so that's like how I think about everything with COVID I think (laughs) like my life and I think this can go without being said for most people you know it's like 
my life without COVID would be entirely different. And, you know, it's like, obviously not to dismiss, like, the terrible thing that it was, yeah. but it's, you know, there were, like, life-altering things, and, and whether that led you to, like, a better place, a more promising place, or a more negative place, like, I think you do have to, like, when you look back, kind of be thankful for, like, the way that it altered our lives, right. you know? Absolutely. I always think about that, too, because when it first happened, I was so bummed out. Like, yeah. it was scary. It was sad. It was, like, all, all the terrible things, and I think, like, when you're sitting alone in the, the suburbs of Jersey, you kind of need to figure out, like, what can I make of this experience? Uh -huh. And for me, it was actually really great because I kind of, like, got a chance to, to like, really hone in on, like, what I do and why I make music. And it sort of gave me an opportunity to, like, restart everything. Um, so, oh, my God, if I didn't have that time, like, I don't know where I would be. I think it just gave me a completely different perspective. Did you have like an artist project before COVID? I did, but I think that I was a little bit lost, to be honest. Hmm. Like I think I forgot why I was making music. I think I was just kind of rolling with the punches. I was just sort of like going about it. Like, okay, yeah, this is like what I like to do, but I kind of forgot like actually why I liked it. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, being in COVID and having like no there was, I had no idea what the future looked like for myself. So it was like, okay, cool. Do I want to make music while I have nothing else to do? And it was like, yeah. So I just kind of got to like sit and um, do it in a completely different headspace, which was really, really cool. Especially when like, you know, I, I feel like your situation makes COVID so uniquely different mm -hmm. too, because like if you took a gap year, yeah. so you started second semester. So you literally were there for two months and then just yeah. like everything was just back to normal. Yeah. That'd be so weird. Cause like in my mind, how I would assume that would go is like, you have like all this time to think about this experience that you're being, you know, being led up to that you've like got to get to this point. You've been thinking like, I'm sure, do you want to go? Do you not want to go? Whatever, whatever, whatever. But then it's like, you get to that point and it's just like, nope, never mind. Yeah. I was so excited too. I was like, oh, next chapter of my life. Like here yeah. I am like LA bound. And it, it took a lot of like working up to get to that point because I was nervous. I didn't want to, I loved New York. Like I felt like I was being pulled to LA against my will. <laughs> like I was like, <laughs> I have to go, I know I do. Um, but I was a little nervous and then I got to a point where I was so excited. And then mm. I got there and I was like, hell yeah, like this is my life now, I live in Los Angeles. And then, <laughs> you know, sent home <laughs> pretty right away. So it was, it was pretty crazy. Uh, tell me about like taking a gap year. Cause that's something that like, I'm actually really interested in because mm -hmm. I have like a lot of musician friends that have done it. And then like some of them, you know, like just not gone back. Some have gone back, mm -hmm. but it was something that I considered doing yeah. like when I first got out of high school. And I, sometimes I think about like where my, where it would have taken me if I did. Mm -hmm. Cause then I probably never went to college because of COVID. <laughs> but totally. was, was your intention to like, what was there like a specific goal you wanted to do with a gap year? Or, like what was your kind of mentality going into it? Um, it was a little bit of everything, to uh -huh. be honest with you. Like when I was in high school, I didn't want to go to college. I didn't have a desire necessarily. Like I was like, I know what I want. Like I've known that I wanted to pursue music since I was probably 12, uh -huh. maybe younger. So I knew that that might not be the trajectory for me is to go to school. Um, so the gap year almost was like buying me time type of a thing. Hmm. <laughs> so I was like, okay. Like figuring it out. Yeah. Figuring it out and just like learning. Like I was, I was living, I grew up in. New Jersey in the suburbs, which is like not the town that I am from. It wasn't very like embracing of the arts, especially what I wanted to do. So I felt like I needed to learn more about myself and like learn about the world. And I was like, I'm not ready. Like, I just don't want to like go to school because that's typically what people do yeah. after high school. I just needed to like go against the grain for a minute, which was actually really tough because like all my friends, my friends, parents, my parents, my teachers, like everyone was like, so what, are, I don't get it. Like, what's your, why are you not going to college? I feel you. you. Don't you want your degree, you know? And it's like a lot of doubt. Yeah. Which I think was very um, pivotal for me because it was like the first time that I was doing something that like people didn't approve of, yeah. <laughs> which was going to be the first of many in my life. Keep talking, so. I'm going to push this mic close to you, sorry. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead, where are you um, Yeah, it was the first of many. Like it was like, you know, my whole life has been doing things that I want to do, not that society wants me to do hmm. um so that was kind of my first try at that and the beginning was so hard I was very sad I was very depressed all my friends were in in college having the best time ever and I was home <laughs> I was home with my mom and I was just like okay I don't really know what I'm doing um and then I got an opportunity to um intern at this like little EDM label in New York and I 
subletted a room from my sister's friend in the East Village. And I just worked my ass off and I performed all over the city. And in that time too, I was like, I told my parents, I was like, I'll, I'll apply to school. Like, you know, just to kind of make them happy. <laughs> yeah. Um, Cause I didn't have, I didn't really apply anywhere senior year. Um, and that's when I, I got into USC and I was like, well, I didn't think, I don't know how this happened, <laughs> but I was like, it's an error. Like they're going to email me and be like, sorry, we didn't mean to accept you. Whatever. You've been revoked. <laughs> yeah, like I was, I was waiting for that. So um, yeah, so then I, I got in and, I, and then I got in for the spring. So it was like, uh-huh. okay, a gap year and a half. And that was kind of enough time oh, for that's me. that's cool. Yeah, so it, it was kind of enough time for me to be like, okay, now I'm ready to like, you know, immerse in um, a different community and like, you know, go back to school. Mm-hmm. I do like some parts of school. Um, so yeah, it was it was fun. But it was, it was a crazy year for sure. I learned like so much about myself, more than I probably learned in like four years of high school. So Yeah, <laughs> I definitely relate to that. I think like, I mean, uh, it sounds like the place that where you grew up is probably like, Decently similar to the place I grew up. I grew up in like, <clears throat> essentially like a East Bay Area suburb, right. and um, it's very much the same kind of mentality. I feel like that looms over everybody. It's like, mm-hmm. you know, like it's very normal to like you go to high school. After <laughs> you go to high school, you figure out what you want to do, and then you go to a four year, get a bachelor's, and then yeah. go work. And there's and you nothing. You play wor- sports in high school. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and, and there's nothing wrong with that path. Like, yeah. But it's like I've always felt like if the main goal, right? It, it, it <clears throat> well, if it's like the main goal, like everyone's future, right? Yeah, is to like at the end game be happy, right? Mm-hmm. If that's like the number one thing we're all shooting for, yeah. I think introducing college as like a one size fits all mentality mm-hmm. is like not conductive to that lifestyle. Totally, I think I honestly I think <clears throat> everyone should do a gap year. Like mm-hmm. I know a lot of people don't have um, the luxury, and I, I totally understand that too. Um, but I think it's like such a great time for people to just like experience things and, yeah. and, you know, maybe travel. I didn't travel that much at all actually, but, um, you know, it was just so, so amazing for me to just kind of step back and be like, I am in charge of my own life. Like I don't have to do what hmm. everyone else does. And if I don't want to go to school, I don't have to, if I decide later, I do want to go, I can. And I think doing that changed like the next the rest of my life, honestly. Yeah, I really relate to that as well, actually, because I feel like there was a very specific moment in my life where, like, I realized that <clears throat> why am I, I'm all I'm, I'm all congested. <laughs> <It's okay. laughs> I realized that like I was in control mm-hmm. of everything that I did, yep. and like there was nobody in the world that could like dictate my future for me. Yep. And that's like a very very like powerful realization to make because it kind of like taught me that like okay I can literally wake up and do whatever I want every day. Mm-hmm. Like I know there's like this like there's this intangible force telling you that like you're not supposed to do that that you know you're supposed to do what everybody else around you is doing and there's nothing wrong with doing that. But I think like it was very important in my life when I realized it's like no like like, my life's really malleable. Like, I can wake up and do the things that I want to do, and there's not really going to be anybody there to tell me that I can't, you yeah. know? And I think your 20s are for that. <clears throat> yeah, I, think I agree. I you should, everyone should just be doing whatever the hell they want to do and figuring out what makes them tick and what makes life mm. fun. I know so many people that will just, you know, go and get their degree and then get a job that they hate, and then there you go. That's the rest of their life. A job that they hate. I've just never understood like that thing specifically. Like, yeah. wh- like why are you paying to go get a, get a job that you yeah. hate? And it's like, it is the life for a lot of people. Like a lot of people prefer that um, like financial stability. Yeah, over which is just, fine. Yeah, which is also so fine. I'm like totally, like, I know so many people that that totally mm-hmm. works for them. And that's great. I just knew from a very young age that that, that wasn't going to be what I did, um, you know. It was, it was not like my, my dad's favorite thing ever. <laughs> my dad was sort of like, are you sure? Like, you don't want to go to business school. Yeah. I was like, yeah, of course. You know, <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure, you yeah. know, so it, you know, it, some, I think just as much as I don't understand that perspective, people don't understand our perspective. Mm. Um, so I think it's just, you know, a learning. Oh, thing. I could see that. We all, yeah. we all have different, I mean, everything perspective, like you said, like we yeah. all have different ways that we're brought up and mm-hmm. taught to look at the world. Like, but I, I don't know. My mentality is always like one of my favorite quotes ever. It's a Jim Carrey quote. He says, you can fail at do you, you can always fail at what you don't want. So you might as well make a chance or you might as well take a chance on doing what you love. So true. And I think about that quote a lot because it's like, it's just very true. It's like, to me, like taking that path never felt risky. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Like, I, like, I feel like sometimes people receive, like, perceive it as risky. Mm-hmm. I never thought of it as risky because yeah. in my head it's like, what is a bigger risk? Like setting your up, setting yourself up for a job <laughs> that like 50% of the time you might hate yeah. or pursuing something that you know you're going to love. Yeah. You know, and it's like, even if that thing that you know you're going to love might not provide you the financial stability, like stability right mm-hmm. off the bat. It's like, there's ways to supplement that and make it work. You yeah. just got to be willing to figure it out, totally. you know? But it's like, that never felt risky to me. Yeah, me too. I just, I like crave that so much more. Yeah, like I'm too. about to graduate and, you know, be catapulted into like the adult world. And mm-hmm. I'm like, part of me is like, I should be scared. I should be petrified but I'm so excited. I'm like, this is great. This is like Mm. so exciting. And I'm like so happy that I'm not going to go. Like, I don't have plans that like September 1st, I'm going to go start working at a firm. Yeah. You know, know? there you go. That would be like pending doom for me. I'd be like, Oh my God, I got to live my entire life until September 1st. (laughs) That is just not exciting for me. Like I'd rather do something that is like constantly stimulating me and um, you know, just testing me and like figuring out like what I yeah. love and what, um, you know, keeps me going. I think that is scary too. Like the <laughs> idea that like, well, I'm going to graduate and then it's like September 1st, there, there it is. Yeah. And then there's the rest of my life because I feel like that is so like, <laughs> it's so like not conductive to like growth. Yeah. And I do feel like there's a certain degree of growth that like is required to be like truly fulfilled every single day. Mm-hmm. Like I feel like every single day, whether it be like career wise, personally, and like some other goal, whatever, you got to be like moving forward. Right. I think that's like very, very key. Like, it, I mean, for me specifically, like, I, I don't know if everybody sh- shares that sentiment, but it's like, I feel like I have to be moving. Like mm-hmm. I have to be moving forward constantly or else like I feel like shit. Oh, a hundred percent. Me too. Like, I live for like crossing out things on my to-do list. Me too. That is yeah. like my bread and butter. Like I love yeah. doing that so much. It's like when I finish a day and I'm like, wow, look at all the things that I I did today and, and you know, move to my goal. And I also think as a musician, like our goals are very, um, they're, they're tough sometimes. Like non-linear <laughs> almost. Yeah. And it's, it's like, they're also like very, it takes so much work, so much patience, so much believing in yourself when no one else does, Yeah, all of that to like make it work. And I think if I had like a very attainable goal and I just was like, okay, I want to work here and I got the job, I'd be like, okay, well, what now? Now yeah. I'm working here. You know, <laughs> I think yeah. I, I crave that like sort of like, ooh, this is really hard. Are you sure you want to do this? Like, I yeah. think I like that now. Like I'm, I'm like, doubt me, do it. Cause <laughs> it just, it, it like fuels my passion for it. it. It fuels my like desire to accomplish it, my goals. So it's, it's kind of, it's kind of funny. Do you think like that desire and that drive outweighs the, the fear of it? Yeah. <laughs> That's <laughs> cool. Days. Yeah. I think, yeah, I think definitely it does because I know when I wake up every day that this is what I'm going to do. I don't have a, yeah. a plan B. I don't. And I've never have, because I know that if I had a plan B, it's going to be so easy to be like, oh, I had a hard day, I had a bad show, I had this release didn't do as well, whatever. And then like, be like, okay, I think this isn't going to work for me. Like, you know, and it's like- I'll find something else. Yeah. It's like, no, I don't have that. Like, this is going to work for me and I'm going to figure out how it's going to work. And every single day of my life is going to be building towards figuring out how this is going to work for me. And that is so fun for me. Like, I love yeah. that feeling. <laughs> I think that's so crucial. It's like cutting the safety net. Yeah. It's like, that's what moving here was for me. It, mm-hmm. It's like, I'm going to build a media company and that's what I'm going to do. Yeah. And there's nothing else I'm going to do. Right. And I was like, I'm, I'm going to make it work mm-hmm. by whatever means. I don't know how, but I'm going to make it work. And yeah. it's like, when you cut that safety net, I think things that things can happen that you never, ever, ever could have predicted yeah. or like foreseen. Totally. Because if you play it safe, it's like, okay, then what do you have to like, Say for yourself. Like, yeah. I just want to, like, I know this is so cliche, but I just want to have, like, no regrets when I'm older. And mm. I'm like, wow, remember when I was 23 and I could have done this, but I was too scared. You know, it's like life is so short. Like, I'm just going to I'm gonna do whatever makes me happy. I'm like, gonna. that's that's scary to me. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, like it's, it's, it's yeah, interesting that you say, like, you know, like, you know, like, I, I, I didn't do this because I was too scared. I'm doing this because I'm scared. Yeah. You know, me like, too. it's like the irony. So true. That's a, that's a great way of putting it. Mm-hmm. Do you think you you crave like that jumping off the deep end? Feel like do you think that's what moving to New York was for you? Um, you know, I think so. I think like New York was a little bit less because I was so ready to do that like mm-hmm. for years because I was wh- where I lived was literally like 
I could see the New York skyline from like a couple streets over from oh, my okay. house. So I was like, oh my God, I can't, I was so close, but so far. And I was like, I just <laughs> can't wait to be there. And like out of like the suburbs where nothing happens and all this. So going to New York, I was like, oh, I'm so ready. Like it didn't really feel like I was like jumping off the deep end. Also my parents were like, 30 minutes away. So uh-huh. I was like, if I need anything. Oh, like, so, so you were that close. Yeah, I was really close. Um, but then moving to LA was a bit of a bigger jump because it was like, oh, I'm going to be far from home. I'm going to be like now a student yeah. again, which is like, I, you know, I'm on my own. Um, so I think that was a, a bigger dr- jump, but it was, it was very scary at first, like I was saying, but then it was like, oh yeah, like I'm so excited to like make yeah. this work for myself. And then when I went back again after COVID, it was like e- that feeling times 10. Cause I was like, <laughs> oh yeah, I can't wait to like, you know, like keep meeting people and, and whatever, figure it out. And, and uh, I needed some stimulation as we, a lot of us did after COVID. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So <laughs> did, so you lived like what, like Jersey city kind of area? Like, in, like in uh, Jersey. Uh-huh. So I grew up in a town called Westfield. Uh-huh. Um, and then in the, in the COVID times, I was in a town right next to Westfield called Mountainside, which, um, there was like a hill kind of close to my house where you can like look over and see the whole, the whole skyline. So it was really cool. It was like a commuter town. So okay. it was like very like suburby, like uh-huh. whatever. So, um, yeah, it was, re- it was a quick train to the city, like a good 45 minute train to the city. Um, like 40, 30 40 minute drive. Yeah. No traffic. So um, my sister also went to school in New York. So whenever I was like tired of Westfield, I'd be like, oh, I'm just going to go and see her. I'll uh-huh. just like take the train in and see her, which so, was like great. So were you like playing shows in New York when you lived in Jersey? Were you like actively involved in kind of like the New York music scene at all? Or like, what was that like? Because I mean, that's kind of like where I fell in love with music personally. Yeah. Like, I mean, I was in Concord, which is like yeah. 30, like 35, 30 minutes outside of San Francisco. Mm-hmm. But it was like, you know, I was going there. Every mm-hmm. chance I got, every weekend, like yeah. every show I could go to, like every interview I could get. It's like I was in the city as much as I wasn't conquered at a certain point. Yeah, I mean, I definitely like, I think wished that I did that a little bit more, mm-hmm. but it, it took me an extra sec to kind of get like really involved in that scene because I just didn't know what to do. I yeah. was kind of like, uh, like I'm kind of stuck in this like weird New Jersey bubble where I'm like, I used to throw shows in my house because there was no there was very few opportunities around where I lived. Yeah. And I had this like weird industrial basement. My mom's like really a big music fan and a musician herself. And um, she was like, let's like throw shows down here. And so, so we cool. built a stage out of like five gallon buckets and these like weird square stage pieces. Um, and we had shows with like three, 400 people. And I used to book In a all basement? of them. Yeah. My mom what? would run sound because she was an engineer for a little. Um, I would do all the booking. My brother would work the door. And I would just have, like, these huge shows at my house because I didn't know what else to do. Like, I yeah. was like, I don't want to perform at, like, the talent show. I, like, I did. <laughs> I, of course I did. But I was like, yeah. I want to, like, actually do something else. And I was having a lot of trouble finding, like, my niche in Jersey. Uh-huh. Um, there was, like, a couple little venues that I would, like, frequent. But it was, like, I wasn't, um, like comfortable enough I think or just ready to like really immerse myself in New York or I didn't feel like I was at the time it's um, a lot yeah yeah but I also think that was very like that shaped my career and just my mm-hmm. myself a lot because I was like just so determined to like do something fun so I was like okay I'm just gonna like set up my entire basement <sighs> of my childhood home and invite literally everyone I know and I would have like Facebook groups how would you get these like artists to play were they like artists like were they make were they like solo artists like you were they like bands like it depends I literally had so many random things I at the point I was I was really young I was like I started throwing them when I was like 15 and then so stopped crazy. At my last one was when I was 18 uh-huh. um and the first one I I was in this band uh, in high school, it was all senior boys and me, um, and we were called Hurricane Nobody, and so Hurricane Nobody played um, a big show, and then we had one other band. What were they called? I forget. But there was like another band that played too, and they were just like uh-huh. high school bands. And then I did a couple more. Where there was one that was this uh, band called Skylar Pocket, who's so awesome. They're just like they're amazing. still around, still around, cool. yeah. And they're they're like so cool, and they uh-huh. they're in um, Jersey, and they play all over Jersey. Um, and then there's this band called Dos Equis, who I don't think they exist. Like I think the they, beer? Like the beer, but they exist, they exist like separately in, oh, okay. in three, and like there's three of them. And then who else? Um, this artist, Tor Miller, who's really, really cool. He's a Jersey person. I saw him open for James Bay 
in 2015 and I just like messaged him on Instagram and I was like, you're so great, whatever. Um, I found out he was like my friend's half uncle. <laughs> so I was like, you want to play at my basement? And he was like, sure. And he did. So I, they, and I always played at them too, but they were always like yeah. super random. Like I had no idea what I was doing booking shows. Like it'd be like in one night, me, who was like a pop piano. I would like literally play piano. And then like a rap group, a rap trio, and then like an indie band. And I was like, this is perfect. <laughs> that sounds sick. My friend Jack, basement? Jack LeBose did like a DJ set one of the nights. Like it, it was so so random like everything i did was just like i had no clue what i was doing but it was like the best nights ever so fun but that's so cool and like sporadic so like yeah. you had like that big of a basement where you could actually throw a show down there yeah it was weird my basement growing up was like the found they accident they accidentally like dug the foundation too deep so the ceilings are really high I don't oh, know. That's and cool. it was all unfinished so it was yeah. all concrete um, and so, and there was like a big window well, so there was like enough exit. So it was like safe. Um, would people come in like through your house? Yeah. They would come in through the front door and then walk. I have this, I just have this crazy vision of like, there's just like a regular suburban oh, yeah. home with like a, like a long ass line oh. and kids just like walking through a kitchen. To like oh, get that's to a exactly basement. what it was. It was so <laughs> funny. And my mom was there just like, Hey everyone. Like it was, it was really cute. And you know, everyone had so much fun. Like I know it was like the best night like a lot of those nights were the best nights for me, but That's I so cool. obviously, but it, I've heard that a lot from other people too, where it was like, this was like so different. Like no one does anything like this. Um, so it was like super fun. I, I miss doing those shows. And now I throw shows at my house too in college. Oh, what? Um, so it's like, I, I feel like I knew sort of a little bit about like the DIY, actually a lot about the DIY sort of concert throwing scene. Yeah. Um, so I, it, I wasn't really going into it with nothing, which was cool. <laughs> did, did your neighbors hate you? Um, no. In Jersey? Yeah. They, they, they were cool. Then? They were cool. Yeah. We had like a great like neighborhood. Like I, oh, I grew sick. up on like an awesome street. Uh -huh. Everyone like moved in when they had babies. And then, so all the babies grew up to be like oh, homies. That's so cool. Yeah. So all of us were like best friends and they would all come. So they'd all oh, so come to out. the shows. Yeah. Um, yeah. In college, though, we do have a little bit of a, a neighbor neighbor's issue, but uh, we've been we go like early shows. So yeah, it's but you know we we do our best. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, yeah, you really do so good at that yeah. point. <laughs> I found I, I I interviewed um my friend Max a couple weeks ago, and he's in like this he's in a um kind of like a like almost like a like a shoegaze hardcore band, but they were um he was telling me about some of the shows they throw. And, like, he was explaining to me, like, the ins and outs of, like, getting people to, like, not hate you in your neighborhood yeah. if you throw a show. But, yep. like, I think that, like, honestly, if it, as long as they're, like, reasonable people, if you give them enough notice, like, they can't, well, one, they can't really tell you not to. Yeah. And then, two, like, they can't be that upset if you're done by, like, 1030, you know, and it's, like, You'd a Friday. Think, really? Like, yeah, they get so mad at us. We have, like, one neighbor. Uh -huh. Um so he, he, yeah, he, he's not happy with us or cause also my house has been passed down generation to generation Just the kids of year. music people. Oh. So it's always been shows. And then the people before us, like, <clears throat> like several years before us would just throw like giant shows and, and like not care about the neighbors. <laughs> so they'd go into like 2am. So now the neighbors who've been there for like years and they're years hypersensitive are to like, it, I yeah. hate you guys, even though they're, we're like, we're different. <laughs> we're not the same ones, you know? <laughs> yeah. So they're just like not having it at all. But, you know, we've we've figured out ways to, you know, we end it on time. Like, we'll usually yeah. stop the music by 10. Oh, yeah. Um, so we're, you know, but it, it depends. Yeah. <laughs> sometimes it's tough. We get rolled kind of early sometimes, so. <laughs> it's gamble. That's funny. So, okay, so you, you, you're, you grew up in Jersey and then you moved to New York. Were, you said you were interning in an EDM, like, agency there? Or was it, like, yeah. a company? It was, like, a management label type of thing. Okay. It doesn't exist anymore. Uh -huh. um, but it was very, very small. And I was interning for a couple months. And then the person that I was interning for, there was six people at the company at the time. Wow, um, small. Was it including me? Including me. <laughs> so it was very small. Um, and it was all men and me. And I was 18. So I was, I was very, very young. Like yeah. having, I would take the train in from Jersey and be like, <laughs> okay, I'm gonna like go. And I was like, always oh, so nervous. Um, and then the guy that I was working under left in november so i'd been there for like three months like just mm -hmm. interning and and my uh the big boss at the time like pulled me aside and was like do you want his job and i was Whoa. like oh sure yeah so and i was like an a and r assistant for when i was 18 um like right away and i had literally no idea what i was doing and i was learning everything on the, uh -huh, in the moment it out. yeah and i was just like okay yeah i can do it i can do it and i did i was actually pretty good at it but i was like 
you know, this is, I know this is just a stepping stone. Like I, I know like this is temporary. It wasn't what you wanted to do. Yeah, but I was like, this is, I'm learning so much right now. Like yes. I know, you know, like I'm, I was like the artist liaison and I was like cool. the young one. So like, I, and a lot of the artists were like young mm -hmm. people. So like I would be a good person to like be in touch with them. Cause I just like knew how to like talk to them and I knew a lot yeah. about social media and, and whatever. So I learned uh, so much in that, um, in that time, but it was, it was super weird. And then I was an A&R assistant for a while. And then my boss was like, okay, you can be the head of A&R. And I was like, what? But it was like such a small company. So he was just kind of doing that. He's to like, like, whatever. Yeah. Ring my bell. He was like, yay, like head of A&R. Um, so <laughs> it was, it was a very silly time though. So I was like fully in a job. Like I was working, um, a nine to five. Like a full-time job. Yeah. Were you trying to get into, into like electronic music at that time? Was that like no. a world you wanted to be in, or just was, it was just just like a job in music? It was just kind of a job. Like it just okay. randomly. Like one of my sister's friends was the original guy that needed an intern. Uh -huh. So and I was like, okay, because I was like, who's gonna hire me? I'm like, I have no idea what I'm doing. Like so it was kind of just it fell on me, and I was like, okay, great. If they're gonna like trust me with all these responsibilities, then I'm gonna do it. Yeah. Um. So I I did that job for um a like two almost two years. Um. Because I did a little bit over COVID, but then. Uh, the <laughs> summer, bless you, bless thank you. you. <laughs> <laughs> the summer before school, I knew that I was going to be a spring admit, so I uh -huh. was like, okay, I'm going to take some classes so I can like go in with like enough credits to be considered like a second semester freshman because yeah. I, I didn't want to like, graduate late. Um, so I did classes at BMCC, which is Borough of Manhattan Community College, and it's I a long name. oh I know so long <laughs> BMCC the the place, and it was right by the World Trade Center. And I had the craziest schedule. I would go, I would wake up, I would go to class from 9 to 12. Then I would walk to work, which was like a 10-minute walk, walk to work from 12 to 6. And then I would go back to campus, campus from 6 to 9. And then I would take the subway home. And then just like, to Jersey? No, no. This is when oh, I lived in the oh, city. Oh, I was like, what? Yeah, yeah. No, I, I moved into the city. Like, I was only commuting for okay. probably two months. Um, but yeah, so that was like my summer. That was like my first sort of summer post um, high school. Yeah. And I was like, oh, like this is really hard. Like yeah. I'm like, literally every single day of my summer was like I was booked from like 8 a.m. to 11 p.m. And I was like, do, I had to do homework. I had to do extra work when I got home. It was crazy. <laughs> so it was it was a crazy time. Yeah, I felt like a big like adult. And I was like, why am I taking on so much right yeah. now? Like, it was weird. That's, so. that's an interesting segue, because segue, I wanted to ask you about like the balance between like yeah. going to school and then making music at the same time. Mm -hmm. Because I feel like, like for me anyway, like, you know, r running a music media company and then going to school, it was like, when I was in it, like it, the, it got to a point where it's like, well, I was doing that plus working like a serving job. It's like, yeah. I, I had fallen into the to the the, the working student yeah. like class without even realizing it, and then I, I, I when I realized that I kind of had to get out of it. <laughs> but it, it's interesting too because I feel like at a certain point it's like if you're going to school for something like it, it becomes hard to go to school for it and then simultaneously create right. at the same time. So like at that time, were you struggling to find time to create, and then how did you kind of alleviate that issue? Yeah, before <laughs> USC, a hundred percent because I was doing music like working. everything yeah, yeah. I, I was it was so hard to create then like impossible actually like I, I don't think I, I didn't do very much at that point which I think set me back a little bit too because I was like I kind of lost my footing there for a minute um and then but I would still do shows a lot I made sure like that was my time to like do shows and then when I got to USC things sort of shifted a bit because um all of a sudden it was like, okay, I'm, I'm a student now. I don't have a nine to five. I felt like I was going backwards. I was like, I'm going from the nine to five to the student schedule, which made <laughs> me be so like, interesting. Yeah. I have so much time where like most people were like, oh God, college, like I have no time. Yeah. And I was like, oh my God, I have one, I have two <laughs> classes a day. Are you kidding? This is crazy. You can do everything. I do yeah. everything. So that sort of set the stage for the rest of college because I like finished on time so uh -huh. like I never had a semester where I took like less credits I always was doing it I was a music industry major so all my classes were uh -huh. music related but I, I I'm not like I'm not like singing all day mm -hmm. which is cool because I, I love learning about like the business side of things I yeah just, I was a music industry major oh hell yeah okay so you get it so yeah. it's like you know we know how to like read a contract and like market ourselves and you do I don't because <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I dropped out but it's okay whatever yeah. it's, I can teach you yeah, you know like thank we, you like I can protect myself now and I'd be in uh -huh. class and I'm like, oh, this is so interesting. I can't wait to apply this to my career. Um, and I was so excited about like 
filling my day with mm. things. So I've, I've always had to, I've always had a job in college. Um, so I've had this like on campus job at like work for one of the schools. Um, this is my last week actually, but I've been there for like almost three years. It's great. Wow. It's awesome. It's just like a remote what do USC you do? job. I like work for uh, like the letters arts and sciences school and I'm just, I'm a student worker on the communications team. Oh, cool. So like with that, I also, I was a full-time student. I worked like probably like 20 hours a week. So not too much, but you know, still a decent amount on top of mm -hmm. school. And then like every free time I had, I would be in sessions or I would be working on music stuff. So um, I, I have kind of always overbooked myself. Yeah. <laughs> like I've kind of always just done that. Like I, I need to fill my day. Like I don't have a ton of free time, which sometimes it burns me out. But yeah. Um, I don't know. It depends on the time you ask me. Sometimes I'm like, I am so good at budgeting my time. I'm so good at it. And other times I'm like, uh -huh. I spread myself a little thin. But, you know, I think a lot's going to change in the next couple of months when school's done. Because now I'm like, I don't need to budget those hours in where I'm like going to be walking to campus and sitting in a two-hour yeah. class and then also writing essays on Sunday nights and all this. So, um, but yeah, I've been able to do like four sessions a week at least um, for, wow. for the past like since kind of COVID uh -huh. stopped, yeah. Are you happy that like you stayed with the music industry program and like went, went all the way through it? Like tell me a little bit about, a little bit about that. Yeah, absolutely. It was, it's honestly like a really chill program. I don't know if USC would want me to say that, but it's, it's very like, for me, it was a great choice because I never had that much school stress. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like I was always sort of just, okay, I'm just gonna get my assignments done. And uh, I'm not even great at school. Like I have like pretty bad ADHD and I have a hard time with it. But at this point it was like, this is all stuff that I'm really curious about. So I'd yeah. be like, okay, cool. I'm like listening and I'm like, oh, this is really interesting. And then um, I never felt overwhelmed in my major once. Like I, I don't think I ever felt like I had too much on my plate with school, like ever. So it was perfect for you. Perfect. And it's, I, it's yeah. interesting too, like at USC, because <laughs> no. that was something I didn't realize <laughs> until I moved here was that like, the USC music industry studies pipeline to actual LA music industry yeah. is like vast. Yes. Like I didn't realize how big it was. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's pretty crazy. It's, it's a really, I like the program cause it worked mm -hmm. for me really well. I think it like, I was able to kind of um, customize my major where I was able to take a like, performance and production classes too. And like songwriting as well. So um, it wasn't like I was just doing oh. music industry the entire time. Like I had to do electives. I had to do like musicianship stuff. So every time I would do that, I'd be like, okay, cool. This course would be really good for my like career, or, like music, my actual mu artist project. Um, so yeah, I was, I, I felt lucky to like be able to have like those opportunities too. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it, it definitely allowed for me to like focus mainly on my artist project, which has always been kind of like my number one. <laughs> and were most, the, were most of the people in music industry studies, like, not pursuing an artist project? Were they, like, you know, they wanted to be an A&R or, or booking agent or something like that? Yeah. Um, oh. Mostly everyone. There's, like, a few of us that uh -huh. are, like, we're, like, the, the staple, like, artists of the program. But there's, like, a whole popular music program that, like, everyone in there is, like, wants to be a touring musician yeah. or touring artist. Um, so, you know, that kind of was cool because it sort of set us apart where we're, like, now we're, like, in classes all the time with all the music industry people, um, which is like, all, they're all just like homies. It's not like people were like, oh, we have to like get you to like me. Like, it's just like it's our friends. It's kind of a cheat code though. Like, a little yeah, bit too. Little bit, yeah. yeah, and I'm like also not like, I knew that if I was going to be studying pop music, like if I was just singing all day, I would come home and I wouldn't want to sing all day. <laughs> yeah. I would just be like, I sang all day anyways. Like, I don't want to go home and produce a song. Like, uh -huh. I just want to like sit around. So now, but I'm like, I am in class and I'm like learning about like how to market myself. And I'm like, this is great. And then I can't wait to go home and like uh -huh. actually do it. So I kind of, um, I'm glad that I, I did that. That's <laughs> so cool. So you, de you definitely feel like you reap the benefits of it. Totally. Yeah. Wow. That, that, that's so interesting to hear from like an artist perspective, mm -hmm. because like for me, it was like, I don't know, part, part of me is realizing more and more that I probably didn't apply myself as much as I should have or suck it out as long as I should have. But it was like, it's all good. yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, I never really like got a ton of benefit out of it, but I also was going to community college. So yeah. it's not like I was doing a ton of like applied music industry courses and stuff. Totally. And you're also like already doing it. Like, I think this is so much more valuable. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. If I'm being thank honest, you. like you're, you're doing your field work. Like you're in the industry, you're doing it, you know, you mm -hmm. don't, you don't need someone to teach you how to do this because you're already doing it. So I think that's also a really interesting thing where it's like, 
a lot of things can you can learn on your own yeah um if you really just like you know dedicate yourself to it um but you know it's some people don't have that like bone in their body to be like oh i'm gonna like just do this on my own yeah they need a little bit of a, a guidance which was me too uh-huh. <laughs> it, it's interesting because i feel like people who went to school always look at people who didn't go to school and are like i wish i did that but then people <laughs> who didn't go to school look at people who went to school and they're like yep. i wish i did that you know but it's really just like it's like part of the human condition it's like yeah. you want to experience or know like what the paths you didn't take would look like but there's no way to know that you know mm-hmm. the grass is always greener yeah exactly but i am realizing is you know like the further i get into my career that like I totally think there are things that, like, I could have benefited from if I stayed in school, like, understanding, like, exactly what a booking agent is telling me when right. I'm talking to them about something or, like, you know, like, well, there's things like that. It, it's, like, stuff like that, like, I definitely could have benefited from, but I don't know. It's useless to, like, think of the past and be like, damn, I wish I did this, you <laughs> so know? true. I can give you my uh, my book that we used in all my classes. Oh, yes. It's, it's basically, like music industry for dummies <laughs> and it was like every teacher was like if you don't have this book you should have it by now like we all and then it would be like our textbook in every class we'd be like okay yeah. we have to read this chapter but it's so it's so like informal it's great but it's oh that, it's a good read i feel like that'd be easier to learn from if oh, it was totally. like informal yeah yeah it's like an easy read because it's like you know in music industry terminology like none of us are like math majors like yeah we, we need it to be like simple <laughs> yeah <for us. laughs> so but I'll give it to you, and that'll teach you, you everything. Oh, hell yeah, I will definitely read it. <laughs> People course. also just throw big words out there to confuse you. Yeah, I know. It's, it's, it kind of, like, simplifies things cool. and just gives you kind of a crash course of everything. So And, and I, like, will refer back to it sometimes. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it's by Donald Passman. It's the one that we – I think everything you need to know about the music business, something uh-huh. like that along those lines of that title, but yeah. Cool. Do you ever find that, like <laughs> – because this is something that I began to realize, I think, too, like, on that note – are there a lot of things that you think are simpler, like, in practice than they were taught? Because that's something that I think I learned, like, very quickly. Like, for example, for example, booking shows. Like, before I ever booked shows, I thought it was the most, like, like this is so com- this is the most complicated, complex thing ever. But unless yeah. you're working with, like, national touring acts and, like, are really talking to, like, you know, like, Wasserman level, like, like booking agents, like, it's really just a series of emails and phone calls. Yeah. And that's something I try to tell, like, a lot of people because I feel like in the music industry, people gatekeep things just to gatekeep things. And it's, like, (laughs) I learned very fast that, like, a lot of these things that seem, like, incredibly complex are, like, not that complicated. Yeah. No, 100%. I think that that, for me, was totally in the production world Mm. Um, because I would, like, sit in these production classes and be, like, oh, my God, I have no idea what I'm doing. Oh, my God, whatever. And then I would realize that I totally didn't know what I was doing. I just was, like, being weird and having, like, imposter syndrome. But whenever I, like, learn something in a production class, it feels so, like, I can't grasp it. And then when I'm, like, Hmm. actually working and I'm producing, I'm like, oh, I've been doing this. Like, this is just what they taught me in class with, like, big words that I didn't understand. So... Yeah, it was so that it's mostly just in in production <laughs> classes, music industry classes a little bit less because uh-huh. um, I don't know. I feel like I've I still get a little confused about things. <laughs> yeah. Like I'm still like I think I understand this so much, uh-huh. and then I'm like, oh, there's something I didn't understand. Well, I also think like in the music industry, there isn't like one way that everything works every time. Oh yeah, like you know, like there's like an end result, right? But, but and the end results like a a show or a tour or, you know, whatever you're going for, like a, like a project, a visual, whatever. It's like, there's like a million different ways to get to those same things. Oh yeah, totally. Like if you go to any artist, like Wikipedia and figure out like what Uh their pipeline was, it's going to be different every single time. Yeah. So that's another interesting about like going, interesting thing about going to music school because it's like what are they going to do teach you how to succeed like they can there try is no yeah. but like you have to be original with it you have to be creative and you have to figure out what your niche is and like do that on your own but you can definitely like take the tools that they teach you and apply them but there's not like one specific way that's going to get you there which i think is something that everyone sort of needs to like everyone gets this reality check like at some yeah. point in music school um, where you're like, oh, like this is just gonna help me. This isn't gonna like <laughs> yeah. make you don't graduate and you're a star. Yeah, <laughs> you yeah, know, yeah. like you have to do the work to get there. It's not like a when I do this, this will happen yeah, thing. It's like a, if I do this, maybe this will happen mm-hmm. or maybe something else will happen thing. Totally, and you have to learn to just get your hopes down, way down. Yeah, you, you know, dream big, but hope expect less. What's expect, the saying? Uh, shoot for the moon, but. <laughs> land in the stars something like or something that. like that yeah, yeah. yeah. like because it's like if you're i have like big dreams and big aspirations but if i'm like 
expecting things from the world and expecting things from people or mm. from experiences or whatever the case may be, that's when I get, I, I find myself getting like really let down and just bummed out. I'm like, yeah. oh, I thought this opportunity was going to give me this opportunity. But when I kind of stop doing that and just, you know, appreciating the opportunities that I do get, then I'm like, okay, this is great. I'm so glad that I did that. I totally feel that. I, I, I think like thinking in terms of expectations can be such a, such like a toxic thing to like trick yourself into doing mm-hmm. because like, I don't know if you relate to this, but like I definitely have got to a place a lot of, a lot of points in my life where I've gotten into the mindset of like, if I do this, then it will get me here and yeah. then I will feel this way. But that is such like a, like an unpredictable way to think. You oh, know? 100%. Yeah. I totally, I totally get that. I've done that to myself a billion times where like I dig myself into a hole that I don't yeah. even realize I'm doing. And I'm like, wow, I can't wait to get this because I got this yeah, and I don't get it. And, and then it'll like, make me feel this way. <gasps> yeah. yeah. And it's, it's, it's a bummer. It's so sad. And you like, you know, can just be so upset with yourself and blame yourself and everything. So I've just learned to kind of keep my expectations low, but like keep my, my dreams big. And it's interesting too, because even, even if like the, the prediction does take you to the place where you thought it was going to, it doesn't feel the way that like oh, you yeah. thought it was going to. Like I remember for so long, I was like, you know, like, once I move to LA and we get a studio, it's going to be different. Like, mm-hmm. like it's going to change everything. And I mean, like logistically, like it has, but it doesn't feel different. Yeah. You know, like it doesn't, it's not like the way I feel when I wake up in the morning is entirely different. So it's like the change is tangible, but it's yeah. not like <laughs> it doesn't feel different. Yeah. Yeah. Cause you're still like in your own body yes. and you're still yourself. And yeah. like, you can imagine your life in any sort of, uh, era, mm-hmm. I would say, but it, you're so right. It's never going to feel like you imagine it to feel, which I think is the case with literally anything. Like you yeah. can't predict how you're going to feel about anything. No. <laughs> so it's, I think every, every day is a risk, honestly, but mm. worth it. Yeah, that's very true. On the, on the note of risks was moving. So going from New York to LA, mm-hmm. did the pace feel super different to you? Like did the two cities feel comparable or are they, cause I don't know. I mean, I've only been in New York once and I live in LA, but it's like, to me, they feel like different worlds. Like, I, I'd be interested to hear what it was like living in one and then going to the other. Yeah, 100%. I think my lifestyle changed dramatically. Uh-huh. So that, to me, was an indication of the cities. But I think it had more to do with, like, my lifestyle. Because, like I was saying, I was working and going to school and, like, you know, taking the subway every morning. Like, I was doing an absurd amount of things. Yeah. Like, I was just... My whole day was filled with things. And then when I got to college, I took like a couple months to like not have a job so I can like, because I saved up a lot when I was um, like working in New York. Um, And then I, you know, like just had a couple classes in a week and I'd be like, oh, like this is so slow. Like I get it now. I get what people mean by the slow Mm. pace. But I was like, I could be doing the exact same thing. And then the longer that I was there, I realized that I'm just like, a fast paced person and I'm like maybe it's because I'm from New York I don't know yeah but like I now that I've been in LA for so long like my life is as fast paced as it was when I was living in New York (laughs) yeah so I think it's really for me the only difference is like when you live in LA you have the opportunity to like get in your car and (laughs) kind of just like (laughs) (sighs) yeah and the other difference is when it rains things just shut down here <laughs> that is very true like, like i've had so many times where i like have a, a session and everyone's like oh like we should move the session because it's raining and i'm like okay <laughs> so like it's little things like that <laughs> where like i've noticed that like it's like the lifestyle is like a little softer here where yeah. it's like people are kind of okay <laughs> with being like in new york it's like no we're, we're gonna it could be hailing it could be yeah. below freezing and there They're could be a tornado it. and like we're gonna meet so yeah. i think that's a little bit different um and yeah i think that that was the biggest difference where I feel like I have time in my day in LA to kind of be like, okay, I'm going to get my car. Like even just driving here, like Uh I have a really a busy day today and I can get my car and be like, I'm just going to like chill out and drive and like listen to music. And I love to drive. So it was like, it's just a nice sort of like check in with myself. And I, I got that in New York, but I was always walking so it's like even like my heart rate was up and it's like that or like I have to get on the subway. I have to get off the subway. Like, you know, it's just, yeah. it's a lot. So I think, um, <laughs> I think they're, they're small differences, but to me, they feel really big. You know, that's actually an interesting point because I've never thought about 
that because I've never lived in anywhere. I've lived on the West Coast my entire life. Mm. I've never lived somewhere like New York. So yeah. it's like, I guess I never, because I, I, I say that a lot. Like I say, like, I love driving to work. Like mm. I love a commute to work. Like I love like, you know, being like a nice 25, like 30 minute commute to work is like my favorite thing in the world. Right. It's not because like the driving, it's just because of like, I get to sit here and listen to music and just check out for mm -hmm. 30 minutes before I have to like go right. have a stressful shift, you know? So it's like, that's something I appreciate and I think about a lot, but I guess I never really considered the fact that people in like New York and cities like that, they don't have that. Yeah. Cause it's a lot of like, okay, you book your entire day. It's like, oh, I'm going to go meet this person at this coffee shop. Cause it's right next to my office. And then my office Whoa. is like, I live right by my office. So like, I know what, like, or I know what subways I have to take. Like there's, it's a lot of like, go, go, go. Yeah. Where LA, I think maybe it's cause things are a little bit more spread out or whatever that I just feel there's like a, a minute to kind of decompress in my day. Um, which I didn't super feel in in new york mm -hmm. i don't know but yeah the only thing i could really probably like associate with that would be like the commute aspect or like the drive um but i also do miss walking places I, I yeah love that. <laughs> yeah there's literally like i always say like it's funny whenever anybody comes here from like the bay or something that's always like the first thing they point out mm. it's that everything is so far apart yeah. and it, it to me la doesn't feel like a city like L L L.A. It's like a bunch of neighborhoods. Exactly. <laughs> like L.A. is like 10 cities like yeah. combined into one, you know, whereas like New York, that's a city. Yeah. You like, can literally walk anywhere. Like I was a huge, my office at the place that I worked at was the very bottom of Manhattan. It was like lower Manhattan uh -huh. financial district area. So my address was 11 Broadway or like the 11, 11 Broadway, just so 11, like 11. Yeah. So it was like <laughs> right on the water. Like you could see the Statue of Liberty from the office. It was very, very low. And then my apartment was um, on 14th street by Union Square. So from my apartment to the office, it was an hour walk. And I did it <gasps> literally every day. An hour? <laughs> an hour. Cause I didn't like, I was so sweaty. How long? Like how like, long was I doing? Like, like how, how long, like distance wise? I think it was probably about three-ish miles. You walked three miles every day? Yeah. And I loved it because it was just like, that was my time. Like that was yeah. my like equivalent. Because for me, the subway isn't, you're on it for like a couple minutes. So you can't even like pull out a book in time. Yeah, it's fast. It's I, so I, fast. I didn't realize how fast it was until I went there. Yeah. Because BART is like, like BART is a uh, barrier rapid transit. Mm -hmm. It's totally different because <laughs> you're, you're traveling to different cities. You know, yeah. it's not like it's like an inner city thing. Like, the subway is inner city. Yeah, it's so fast. Like, each stop is, like, two minutes. Also, like, I got so obsessed with the idea of New York, New York public transit when I was there. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty it's great. It's crazy, mm. like, how efficient the whole web is and how oh, everything's, yeah. like, so close to one another. Also, it's hella confusing. Like, like... <laughs> you <laughs> the, get used to it. This sounds so touristy, I'm pro probably, right now, but it was, like... Like, I didn't understand the concept that there was, like, an uptown and, like, a downtown yeah. subway. And, like... <laughs> It was, it was a lie. It was confusing, but. Oh, totally. I remember when I was like a kid and I yeah. was also born in the city and my parents are both just like very much New Yorkers, mm -hmm. my mom especially. And she would take us into the city and be like, okay, kids, this is uptown. Do you know what uptown means? Like, what does it go towards? And we'd be like, the Bronx, <laughs> the Upper East Side. And she'd be like, okay, downtown. Like, what is this going towards? And be like, you know, like East and West, like East is Brooklyn, West is in New Jersey, like we would have to know it. And then when I got there, um, I like literally would study. Yeah. I'd be like, I need to know where I'm going. Like, I'm not going to be like one of those directions outside the subway type of uh -huh. people, even though I still am. But like, I really wanted to be like, I want to confidently know exactly where I'm going. And I still get on the wrong subway sometimes, but we all do. So don't, don't let it get you down. That's so interesting to me that it's like an entirely different culture. Like yeah. it's so different like because it's, it's crazy that you said like your mom would like tell you these things because it's like that's like a new yorker like yeah. that's like part of be living in that city. city girl she she loved she wanted us all to just like know where we were going yeah and how to get around which i'm i'm grateful for but in the moment i was like okay mom like i don't care like whatever mom this is a lot <laughs> it's a lot you know i'm seven but you know <laughs> it, what did she do musically you said she was a musician yeah my mom's honestly she's such a powerhouse she's done so many things um uh -huh. she Grew up in Jersey and then she was a, she worked on Wall Street for a little while. Mm -hmm. um, and then she quit to have my sister who's older than me. Um, so then we moved to the suburbs and then she had like, and then she had me and then we moved to Jersey. And um, she was just a stay at home mom for a little while, a few years. And then she was in this order, a solar panelist for a while. <gasps> 
And then she was a piano and guitar teacher for a while. She slays that. She still does that too. Um, and then she went back to school because she always wanted to be a therapist. She's done everything. Oh, oh! In between that too, she was she did uh, she was a recording engineer for a bit. They, wow! In the same basement that I had the shows in, her mm-hmm. and her business partner at the time like built a recording studio. Um, so they would record like New Jersey punk bands at like cool. midnight, and I'd be like having you know to go to ninth grade the next day, and I was like. <gasps> I'm just like, you know, I loved it. It's so one cool. in the morning. You're hearing yeah, like, like a hard ass, yeah. like breakdown. And I you're like, damn, I, was so I, I gotta it. sleep. No, I literally was such a night owl. I'd be like, this so is great. Sick. So yeah, it was cool. And then um, she went back to school, um, kind of like over COVID sort of. And uh, now she's a therapist. So cool. and she, that's like always been sort of her like dream uh-huh. job. She just, it took her a minute to like figure out how she was going to go back to school and what that was going to look like for her. Yeah. Um, so yeah, she finished and now she's 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 killing it. Was she the person who got you involved in music and interested yeah. in music? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, I see. So, so did you start like as an instrumentalist or did you start as a singer? Um, mostly as an in- instrumentalist. I don't really like uh-huh. remember because I was really young. But my mom um, is a piano player. Um, she plays guitar too, but main mainly piano. So when I was like old enough to like walk or mm-hmm. talk, she, uh, she was teaching me the piano. Um, so I've I've been playing since I was pretty young. Um, and then I had like an actual like teacher, piano teacher, I think when I turned five or six. Um, And then I started singing because my sister started singing. She was older than me and I just wanted to do whatever she did. (laughs) And so she started singing at like our piano recitals. Yeah, yeah, whatever. I'll admit it, you know, who cares? Um, She's also in music too. So it's it's, it's funny because like she, she's in electronic music, but Mm -hmm. she like, I remember when she was like, I want to sing and I want to sing like, I want to play and sing. And she did Love Song by Sarah Borelli's for our piano recital. New York legend. And I was like, I want to, like, that was cool. That was really cool. Like, I want to do that. And I just played, like, a little piano thing the same year. And then the next recital, six months later, I was like, I'm singing. I'm going to do it. So I sang Let It Be by the Beatles. And that was my first. And then after that, I was like, I'm never not singing, like, pop music again. Yeah. I'm just doing, like, that's what I want to do. And then that kind of, like... Gave me the the singing and playing bug, uh-huh. and then that never never faded. When you just said Sarah Borealis, I started thinking about like all of the like good ballads there are about New York, like <laughs> so like, many. like Manhattan by Sarah Borealis, uh, yeah, um, the Billy Joel song, mm-hmm. like like there's like Empire State of Mind, yeah, Alicia Keys. There, there's a lot. That's crazy. Yeah. There's a lot of like New York ballads, like singing. Like piano singing, like classic ballad about Manhattan. Yeah, I mean, it's a, everyone loves that place, including me. Mm-hmm. I feel like there, there's so much to be said about it and written about it, and same, same with LA. Honestly, there's so many songs about LA. Yeah. Or that people like mention LA living here, but it feels New different. York feels so specific. It feels specific, and it, it's like more about like the energy and the vibe yes. instead of someone's like personal experience. Mm-hmm. Like the Alicia Keys song "Empire State of Mind," like it's her. Um, is that that's. That's what it's called, I think. Mm-hmm. I'm pretty sure that's the name of it. But she, yeah. um, you know, it's just about like what the vibe you're getting in New York is and what you're seeing and what you're doing, whatever. And then like a lot of the songs where like LA is referenced, I feel like it's like in Industry. personal anecdotes. It's like yeah. me and my boyfriend drove on Venice <laughs> Boulevard, whatever. Yeah. Like, you know, so I, I feel like it's different in that way where, um, you know, New York, it's like people are in love with New York. <laughs> yeah. I feel like a lot of the LA songs too are like personal anecdotes about like the industry. Yeah. You know? Whereas like <laughs> New York, you don't really get that. So true. Yeah. Because there's not much, like there is an industry there, but it's like more uh-huh. kind of like underground. Like people don't really like to be like, I'm a music industry person. Like they're just like, yeah, just look here. <laughs> they're embarrassed. I work in music. It. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> in LA, it's like a flex in New yeah, York. I don't know if you heard, but I work, you know, for a label. That's what's yeah. like so much cooler here. Yeah. I just like, oh, this new A&R job. <laughs> I don't know if you're. Like, wow. Oh my God. You know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, so you're in, so you lived in New York and then you're, you're coming up in Jersey and you're playing the piano. <laughs> when did you, do you think that? helped you when you got into production and then when did you start teaching yourself to produce yeah i started teaching myself production and i think i was 16 or 17 mm-hmm. it's pretty young and it was basically because i had visions of how i my one of my songs to sound that i was writing and no one could do it for me like i i didn't have mm, to do it yourself yeah it wasn't like i know a lot of people who grew up in like cities where i was like oh i you know my friend's friend is <sighs> you know, this crazy producer who produces for Beyonce. Yeah. I don't know. I didn't have that in New Jersey. No one Uh was, no one had that for me. Um, so I was like, I'm just going to teach myself. And I was terrible in the beginning. I mean, it was not good. 
<laughs> but none of us are. But I think like that gave me like the start of the like sort of imposter syndrome situation where like mm. I have now been producing for 2016 to 2023 like seven years wow so a long time and I know like t multiple DAWs now like I know what I'm doing where'd you start in I started in uh Logic well okay. I guess technically GarageBand mm -hmm. and then shifted over to Logic and then recently actually I shifted over to Ableton um so now I like mainly use Ableton but sometimes I'll like back to back and forth a little bit um yeah so production was like I didn't really like want to be a producer. I was like, I don't want to like produce for other people. Like yeah. I'm just doing this cause I need to for myself. Cause I like, like out of necessity. Yeah. And there was, you know, nobody that was doing it for me. And I also, I think as like a woman in that, in, in that side of things, like there's not very many female, like there, there was, but in presented in the media, very few mm. females were getting recognition for being producers and just any kind of, big title in the music industry like it's behind as most industries are um For in sure. terms of like female and like non-male representation and I think like at that point I was like well you know I need like I felt like I needed like some old guy to come in and like produce for me. <laughs> some and guy that like, looks what? like Rick Rubin. Yeah, yeah you know I was like what am I doing and then I have this friend who I met in New York her name is Vaughn she's an artist and a producer and she is incredible. Shout out to Vaughn. She, <laughs> she's so dope like mm. seriously like she started as like uh, a mentor kind of and she still is but she's like more one of my best friends now cool. but I met her at like a very kind of influential time in my life I was um I was 17 and she was just a incredible producer and I was like she's doing it like she <laughs> knows what she's doing she's doing the damn thing yeah and then she encouraged me so much as like a young person a young woman mm -hmm. to be like you don't need all these people doing it for you yeah learn how to do it yourself and I was like so right and that I think just set the stage for my future and sh I think if I didn't have her as like that sort of like pushing me off the ledge moment where it's like mm. okay go and do it I might have not done it um and then now I'm surrounded by so many like incredible female producers my sister included where it's like I have such I have this network of like incredible females around me that are just doing it and doing it with the idea in mind that they're in an industry that's been historically dominated by men. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's really powerful when you have like your closest people around you are the people that are doing it. So like actively unworking that. Yeah. 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 They're like the trailblazers. Yeah. And that is so, um, you know, it just feels really good and feels really right. So that's beautiful. Yeah. You know, I think there is like a lot that comes with like, you know, you, you can be on the verge of doing something forever, but, like, having somebody who's, like, there to give you that final push, like, push you in that one direction yeah. and be like, okay, no, I am going to do this because mm -hmm. somebody else believes in me. Totally. That's, like, infinitely valuable. Like, right. I think everybody needs that, you know, because it's so hard to make, like, big decisions in your life only based off of your intuition. Mm -hmm. When you have somebody else that believes in you, it makes it a lot easier. Yeah, especially when you're that young. I yeah. mean, like, everyone that you talk to is like, oh, well, I can help you. Not, like... I could help you, but yeah. I'm not going to because yeah. you could do it yourself. And that's like the biggest thing is it's so hard to, to like just not feel like you need other people and to mm. do it on your own. Um, so I think that was a huge thing. And then that was very um, important for me when I started putting music out. Cause like my first EP that I put out, I produced the entire thing mm -hmm. and wrote the entire thing. And it was so like gratifying. I'm sure. Yeah. It was, it, it was really cool. Cause I was like, wow, I just like, really just did that like I produced hmm. this entire project and I didn't think that I would be able to do this a year ago and I did um so I think that is like a really really cool feeling for sure yeah I'm sure because it's like it, it's it's yours you know it's not like it, and I'm not saying if somebody doesn't produce their own music it's not theirs of course it's still theirs yeah. but it's like every like like your your brain is on like every part of that project like right. that there's something so beautiful about that like it's like a full expression of you you know mm -hmm. totally and I think that also set the stage for me too, because now I work with so many people. I like, yeah. I, I'm not just by myself. I co-produce a lot. Sometimes I have other people produce for me. Sometimes I produce on my own. It totally depends on like what the day has in store for me. Yeah. But now I feel like whatever scenario I'm in, I know how to communicate what I want and mm -hmm. I know how to, I'm not just like waiting for someone else to like make calls for me. Yeah. I'm like, I know what this, I know what this should be. Or, you know, I just, I'm not going in with like a blind sort of like, 
I'm just like, I know how to write lyrics and that's yeah. it. Like I know what I want and I know what I want my music to sound like. So I think starting with a production, somewhat of a production background was really helpful for me. And like now going into sessions like four times a week, I'm like, okay, I can like communicate to people and um, it's really helpful. And correct me if I'm wrong, cause obviously I wouldn't have had this experience, but I'm sure that makes it a lot harder for like male producers to <laughs> try to like dominate a sound. That's something I've heard from like a lot of female musicians talking about like when they've been in sessions with male producers, they've like, almost try to override their opinions or like kind of walk all over like whatever they're trying to say and not respect any input. Like I'm sure that when, when you can like speak competently about exactly what you want and the vision that you have, I'm sure that makes it like a lot more difficult for these men to like walk over like a female musician. Yeah. I mean, I just, I've had experiences like that before, like before I sort of had this like ability to communicate mm -hmm. and I won't work with anyone that of course. has that energy towards me. Like if someone's working with me, like they need to know ahead of time that like, I'm not just going to sit back and be silent and mm. like, just let them do their thing because I'm a very like active um, writer and producer and I, I need to be, you know, involved in all the decisions. Um, so now I don't really worry about, have to worry about that because I choose to work with who I work with and yeah. it's all people that the men too, like men, women, anybody, I, just choose people that make me feel very good and make me feel like, okay, like our inputs are both very important. Yeah. And you know, if someone ever were to be like, eh, like, or if I'm just talking and no one's listening, I would be like, yeah. okay, I'm never working with you again. <laughs> like yeah. Easy as that, you know, but luckily I haven't had that for a little, a couple of years, but um, definitely I've had that before. And, yeah. You know, we all have, to be honest, like every single non-male in the music industry has yeah. experienced that where it's like, okay, they're sitting in a session and like, you're like, uh, you yeah. know, you're just trying to get Can a word of that. Yeah. yeah. And it's like, or it's like eh, you know, like they just like, they don't realize they're doing it, but they are. Um, so that's a, it's a tough one. But now I just sort of like, I don't know, I've, I've been there. So I know how it feels and I know how to like, uh, stick up for myself. Uh, that, that's awesome. Yeah. I, I was, it's funny we were talking about this cause I had a conversation about this with another friend of mine who makes music last night and she was talking about like like I, me and her were kind of just talking about this and we, I, I like made the realization in my head that like it was, she, she, she like made it clear to me and then I kind of like was like wow like I guess I never thought about it like that that like it is more common that women have had experiences like that oh, yeah. than haven't had experiences like that and I've that's written so many papers crazy about that to in me. college too. Yeah. I just like I get so passionate about that because like yeah. even my mom when she was an engineer her partner her a business partner at the time um was a man and my mom like <laughs> knew more about some of it than he did. Mm -hmm. And whenever there was a band in record, it was also her house, it was my mom's house. <laughs> he was just like working out of it, yeah. you know? And there would be like a band coming in and like they would only ask him questions. And like my mom would be like, I actually know that more than him, thank you. Yeah. Um, so I, I had this like, I did wow, a, a crazy. TED talk for school. Like it was like one of my assignments. Uh huh. This is my first time I really got, it was like sophomore year. So it was my first time I really got to like get into the nitty gritty about this kind of yeah. thing. And people were presenting on like literally anything. Like it was just about <sighs> Ted talks. Like someone before me, who was one of my roommates now, like presented on monkeys. And then I went and I was like, this is why <laughs> women need to be, you know, like I just came in with like so hot headed, yeah. which I would do it again. Like now I've written <laughs> so many, like it's a big focus of mine in the music industry. That's beautiful. And I love bringing that to like any conversation in the music industry. Cause it's like, there's a lot of females and non-males in my major. And it's like really cool to have like, we'll have like a full female panel. And like, I love asking, like I'm, s I would just, not shut up the entire time. Like I'm hearing just like, experiences. And yeah, just like, yeah. And I'm like, what's it like with this? What's it like with this? You know? And it's like, I want the men in the class to sit and be like, Oh my God, I didn't realize that women could feel that way. You know, I think just everyone needs to be uh, educated. I think that's like so vital. Yeah. I think because that's like real progression in my totally. eyes, like allowing people, especially men, it's like and students and students, of yeah. course, to like understand like mm -hmm. what these women are going through right. because it's like, like, I've, I, like, I'll never have that experience, you know what I mean? So it's, like, to hear someone talking about that is, like, valuable for me because then I can begin to understand, like, learn about it, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Which is, like, very, very valuable. Yeah, absolutely. for sure. Um, So talking about, like, how you kind of had that hand in the production and, like, did pretty much everything, like, mm -hmm. on your EP, with your live sets and, like, when you perform live, is that kind of the same way you, like, cater your live set? Because I saw you play live with um with Lance at the 29th Street show. And it, it like you guys 
like not to gas you up too much, but uh, you and your band were like super, super in sync. It was really cool. Thank you. Yeah, Thank of you. course. But hey, like, gas me up. I'm here for it. <laughs> <Awesome>. <laughs> but so when you're like getting ready for a show and stuff, are, how long beforehand are you rehearsing your set? Mm -hmm. And then do you like, are you very specific about like with the way you and your band are playing? Yeah, for sure. I mean, the band that I play with, uh, we've been playing together for a while. Uh -huh. um, so we've kind of got it down like pretty well where it's like, we don't need to have too many rehearsals or like that long of rehearsals. So for my show Monday, we're rehearsing today and we're just probably just rehearsing today. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, you know, a few days before, but I like to have like a few days to just be like, okay, what can I practice? Mm. Um, but it totally depends. Cause I like to switch everything up every time. Like I like to, I don't like That's to cool. do the exact same thing every time. Cause it's like, I'm just starting out. So a lot of people at my shows are like people that have seen me before. <laughs> so yeah, I'm like, yeah. I want to like give them something that they've never seen. Um, even if they've seen me before. Um, so yeah, I put my biggest thing about being an artist is playing live. I love it. Like it's, I've always loved it since I was very, very young. So it's, I put, I put everything into it. What sure. about it? Do you think makes it your favorite? I just love being on stage. I yeah. love being, I love being able to share my music with people. And I love just the connection of like being able to like look into someone's eyes and like yeah. literally like I'm doing right now like okay I'm gonna sing this entire lyric to you <laughs> and it's so funny because it's like people are either like what do, they, what do I do you know yeah. or it's like wow I can really like feel what you're saying like you know connection yeah yeah it's like a, it's a human connection I think that having that not to go back to COVID but having that COVID gap also really like brought this desire to perform live again because it's like wow when you're playing so much music over a live stream or just in your room it's like you crave <laughs> that like having people like jump around that directly transmittable energy like that yeah. tangible feeling in a room totally and like at that 29th street show that you were at like i had my first like mini mosh uh -huh. and i was like oh my god like it was the <laughs> i was like this is so crazy Ooh. like yeah. it was so exciting you know um and i just love playing with a band like uh -huh. my band is like some of my best friends That's in the world awesome. so it's like really cool i've been playing with my drummer since freshman year i've been playing so with my cool. guitar player for like two years it's same my like bassist same we've been playing together for so long like i'm just i love them and they know me they know my music they are so supportive i just know all of them are going to do like the coolest things yeah. so i'm just excited to see and I'm, I'm grateful that they like spend their time with me now that's so beautiful <laughs> did you play like when, like when you were when you were in, in New, or i think we we're talking about this earlier like when you were in new york for yeah. example where you weren't playing with a band at that time yeah i was alone how different is the contrast oh, it was so different oh yeah my God. playing with the band changed things for me because i was so used to like i would literally roll up with like my laptop a stand and like a midi controller and so I almost would, like DJing, like like you, like you, you were running yeah, your own tracks. Yeah, I would like I would like launch my own tracks. Uh -huh. So it'd just be me, and I'd literally like t take it on the subway, and just like you know, be by myself, <laughs> and like roll up to soundtrack and be like, yeah, it's just me. Yeah. Um, and I got you know that was cool. But then when I played with a band, I was like, oh my god, it's yeah. like a whole there could be a whole nother energy transfer on stage where mm. it's like I can interact with my guitar player who's my roommate who i literally interact with every single day yeah i can you know it's like it's just such a fun thing where like all of us know this music so well now and we're so excited about it and at least mm. i am but you know i think they are too <laughs> but we can all kind of like interact with each other um and that gave me like a bug where it was like mm. i'm not gonna do the other way again like I'll, yeah i run i i do tracks so like i have the tracks on there but like i i love having at least one other person with me um just to like have a, you know a fun time on stage. It's it's about having fun, you know. It's the, the energy, day. yeah, yeah. So and I love like jumping around and just like having a fun time. Like I always leave the stage like dripping sweat, <laughs> you know. And it's like that's more fun when like everyone everyone around is you too, sweat, yeah. You know, so yeah. yeah, of course. I think there's such like a like I mean even even just from like a a show goer. Like mm. I think there's such a difference in like a solo artist playing their music with a band yeah. versus like not. And mm. I think you especially see that when like you have a bill full of solo artists and one without a band tries to follow one with the band. Mm -hmm. I think that is when you see that like the most. So it's like I, I, in my eyes, like I think it's, it's coming to the point where it's like, it's so necessary because everybody does it yeah. now for the most part. I feel like, in the past two years, may maybe it's just people I've seen, but in the past two years, I feel like I've seen such yeah. an increase in like solo artists playing with bands, you know, mm -hmm. whereas a lot of the time before, I feel like people were running tracks a bit more often. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it's definitely a completely different ball game, I think. Yeah. And I think people make it work when they don't have a band. Like I've mm-hmm. seen it succeed. Totally. Of course, yeah. Um, but for me, I think I just like prefer it a lot more. Yeah, and it's it's more fun. I think once I've gone over to the band side, I did a acoustic show a couple weeks ago, and mm-hmm. I've done that before too, where it's like I can, um, you know, it's just me and my guitar, which I like doing, but like. I cannot do Different a set energy. that's more than, like, 20 minutes. Yeah. Because I'm like, oh, everyone's bored. You know, like, I'm <laughs> bored a little. Like, I'm just, like, strumming my yeah. guitar, and I'm like, oh, I don't know. So <laughs> it's fun, and I think that, like, that gives me a perspective, uh, like, a chance to, like, talk to people. Like, uh-huh. I don't talk too much in my sets. Um, and But when I do acoustic, I'm like, I don't shut up the entire time. I'm like, how's everyone? You know, I'm like, just... Br- I'm How was your day on like, a scale of 1 to 10? Literally, I'm, like, explaining every single song all this so i think that's a it kind of gives like a different sort of experience but um if i'm doing like a full show it's gonna be it's gonna be with the band yeah <laughs> I, I i i think something that i've begun to realize too on that note is like the power of like doing both like me and mario saw um we, we saw a car a couple oh, a couple yes. weeks ago at the novo and he did this really cool thing where he just you know was playing his songs like normal and then halfway through his set he just stopped like, he just disappeared, wasn't on stage anymore, and he just walked off stage. Nobody knew where he was, and he walked to, like, this, like, uh, how would you explain, like, what, it was, like, a, almost like a, like a table, like a center console. <laughs> like a yeah, stage. like a platform, like a little tiny stage, like, that was in the GA area. What? And he just had his phone, and he plugged into a mixing board and just started playing unreleased music, like, on the aux, and was, like, he was, like, in his Australian accent, he was just, like, can I play uh, some, some unreleased stuff real quick? That's so cool. Was he, like, raised or, up? Or Br- British, I guess, huh? Yeah. Was he raised? Mm-hmm. Like, so he was like, people were just like, ah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I'll so, yeah, show you. It was that is so, so cool. cool, though. But I realized, I think, at that show, like, the power in, like, the contrast. Because mm-hmm. it was like, he was doing two totally different things, like, back to back. And it made it, like, even more interesting. Like, look. Yeah, this is it. Oh, my God. So That's it's just like a little, like, he just went up to, like, the interface. And just, like, wow. this is, like, in the Novo and GA. That's so cool. Yeah, it, it was like one of my favorite shows I've been to in a while. Wow, but that's yeah, really, it, it that's was really sick. it was so cool though. But it's like I think then I realized like the power and like even then like a full band set, you know, having like an acoustic moment, yeah. like stopping and like mm-hmm. because it's just such a contrast in energy where it's like they're feeling something entirely different yeah. than they were before. You know, totally. I think like every set I had a whole class about this actually, um, but I, every set kind of like should have that dip in yeah. energy because then it's like mm. if you're just going like. 100% the entire time it's like the 100% is actually gonna be lower yeah it's like you can't do that the entire time so um yeah it was like pretty interesting learning about that because now I'm like okay in the middle of my set I'm gonna play like a really low kind of energy sad maybe ballad moment song so <laughs> you, you know th- that's actually a really interesting way to look at it I, I, I never thought I never thought of it like that mm-hmm. because that's how it, I do it but yeah. I mean obviously people can do whatever they it, uh-huh. but <laughs> well was, well it, it's almost like a setup you know yeah. it's like the idea of like if you if you play a bunch of songs and it's like on an energy level, it's like mm. this one's an eight, this one's a nine, this yeah. one's an eight. I if do you it in drop, a number system yeah. actually. Really? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I one of oh, my professors cool. is like t- introduced that concept to me. And so like, it dropped like a two to set up for the ten. Yeah. So it, the scale is from one to five, and your uh-huh. five would be. This is literally just taking this exactly from my professor's mouth. So <laughs> creds to my professor Chris Sampson on this. Shout one. out to Chris Sampson. Yeah, he rocks. But yeah, so basically <coughs> he was he says how you should um, label your songs one to five. Mm-hmm. Five being like the most intense. That would be like your last song that you, um, you know, your can closer. See. Yeah, yeah, your closer where it could just be like maybe the one that everyone knows, like the one that just kind of gets everyone thinking or just mm-hmm. ends on like a very doesn't have to be like the fastest one or you know the loudest one but just the one that really like sticks with people exactly and then you know a four is a little less than that but still high energy blah blah blah. that goes down to like a one would be like a acoustic sort of like Mm -hmm. low-key vibe um and yeah so you can like organize those numbers if you assign all your your um songs a number it's like you can figure out so i know what my five is at every show so like i have like the five that I've been recently doing is like always going to be my closer. And I love doing it too. It's like, it's my favorite one to do la- last. It just makes uh-huh. sense. What song is it? It's my song called Would You Object? It's not out yet, but it's coming uh-huh. out in, I think July. Um, and it's just kind of like, it starts really like chill. It's just like me and the acoustic guitar. And it like builds into this like big drop, like this big guitar, like part. And uh-huh. um, it just gets really crazy. And then the end, 
um, you know, my, my drummer, Becca, it's just goes so hard. It's so fun. And then like, I just, I'm kind of like yelling at the end a little bit and it's just, it ends right back on like the acoustic kind of just me and the guitar. I like the silence. Yeah. Yeah. Like it returns to where it began. Yeah. So it's, it's, I feel like it's one of my most like dynamic songs where I, I kind of like dip up and down a lot. Um, so it's my favorite one to do, to do last, but yeah, I, that one's going to stick with me as my last one I think, uh-huh. for a while. So, so are you, you, now you're kind of moving to a place where you're actively playing new songs, like stuff that isn't on the EP? Yeah, I've actually kind of like, this is probably not the best idea, but I've been doing it for, for a while. Uh-huh. I just love like whenever I make a new song, I'm like, oh, this would be so good live. Like, <laughs> yeah, I've been doing that for a while. So like, I've kind of like not, like I play the EP songs, mm-hmm. like my EP that I put out in September. Um, cause that was like my first, um, I've released an EP like in 2018, but mm-hmm. it's, it's not it's not up anymore. So that was the one I was like originally talking about. But the one that I put out in September, Mud, Mud yeah, that's the one that like I will play like a couple of the songs from, and then I have like a lot of them that I've been playing that aren't out. <laughs> so totally depends uh-huh. on like the vibe. But um, yeah, I, I play a lot of stuff that's not out that people are like, wait, you've been playing this for so long, like why uh-huh. is this not out? So I have a song coming well, out. That's on. kind of a good thing. I think. Yeah, yeah, it is, and I have like a song coming out Wednesday. Um, that I've been playing live for a year and a half. So oh, like I whoa. had a couple people be like, this isn't out yet. And I'm like, no. Like, <laughs> so it's like, that's exciting now. Cause I'm like, people are familiar with the song. Mm-hmm. Um, and now it's going to come out and it'll be like, you know, more of a moment where it's like, oh cool. I remember. It's like I remember hearing this live. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So that's kind of like what I've been, what I've been going for. Oh, that's cool. So are you actively like now moving into a, a scenario where you're like releasing new mm-hmm. material, like post kind of post EP? Cause I guess it's been like over a year, right? It's been, so I put it out in September. So it's been like. Like almost a year, I guess. It's yeah, like nine months, nine months ish. Yeah. Uh Um, so yeah, I'm in kind of release mode now starting. I have releases kind of set until like the end of 2023, Uh like frequent ones. So, um, I'm really excited about it. (laughs) I I can't wait to like be putting music out again. Um, it took me an extra sec to like finish these ones. Um, but now that they're done, they're, uh, they're going to come out. So, yeah. You said you have a song dropping on... Wednesday. Wednesday? Yeah, May 10th. Oh, hell yeah. Well, I'm pumped to hear it. It's it, I'm excited. It's This is also has been written for a while, but I uh-huh. timed it well um, with my, my graduation because it's like the first lyric is... Um, it's called Hey Dad. It's basically just me like apologizing to my dad about like <laughs> sometimes being like a little bit like not um, smart about my decisions, I guess, yeah. or like, you know, in his eyes. Um, the first line is like, sorry that I would have dropped out of college if it wasn't for you kind of like encouraging me not to yeah. slash making me stay. <laughs> you <laughs> but know? you did it. You stuck it I out. I stuck it out. So it's like funny that the, the timing, cause it's like a lot of it is about like school and like, sorry that I'm bad at math. Uh-huh. Sorry that like blah, blah, blah. And I'm, I'm timing it like funny with my, my college graduation. So, <laughs> yeah. It'll be yeah, it's like all the like, ironic. Yeah, it is. Cause it's like, Ooh, sorry. I'm like all this, but yeah. then I'm like, but here's my <laughs> diploma. <laughs> so, but like proved you wrong. Yeah. <laughs> <Got 'em. laughs> so yeah, that, that's exciting. That's the first one. And then I have like a double release kind of, um, uh, conceptualized for like July, August time. Mm-hmm. And then I have like one, one, one until the end of, uh, November, early December. Hell yeah. yeah. Well, I can't wait to hear it. Thanks. Yeah, no worries. Thank you for sitting down and doing an interview. Appreciate it. This of course. is this is a fun conversation. Yeah, I felt I like we had a lot of like cool things I don't usually get to like touch on a ton. So that was awesome. Yeah, this is great. Thank you so much again for having yeah, me. Yeah, no worries. So you said new song Wednesday? New song Wednesday, yeah. So New-10. tell them what, what's today? Today's the fifth? The Thursday? The fourth. Okay, we'll try to get this out before then. <laughs> okay, no pressure. <laughs> but if it but, but if it isn't, just tell them where they could stream it, the name of the song, where they yeah. can follow you, etc. All the For things, sure. all the promotions. Yeah, the song's called Hey Dad. Uh, my name is Maddie Davis. It'll be um, anywhere that you listen to music. Um, Maddie spelled M A D D Y. Davis spelled normal. D A V I S. Yeah, there you go. Beautiful. <laughs> all right, thank you so much, Maddie. Of course, thank you so much yeah. for having me. Music matters.